Hello? 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Do you? I, I get to introduce. You. Okay. I'm sorry. So we're just handing off the microphone here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Annette Hutton, and the next speaker is, uh, is Eilish Bedro, who's going to be the handoff at about yeah. noon. Yeah. Um, and I will actually not be able to make that introduction, so you'll need to. I'll do it. Very good. Um, and Annette's going to be talking to us about a few things today, uh, the role of research design and methodology in evidence-based medicine and informatics. She comes to us with a background in health policy and health services research. And um, in particular, she's looked at the science to determine what works for whom, at what cost, and under what circumstances. And she's also examined how our health system works to support patients and providers in choosing the right care and how to improve health through care delivery. She's had prior positions in the government, which I didn't know about, so I'm yeah. curious to hear about. <laughs> okay. what, what did you do for the government? Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I look forward to your presentation. And I think the, one other thing, I understand yeah. that you're going to plug a survey for the yeah. HCI students. Yeah. We want to know about your experience with the method, methodology that's been taught in the classes, so please answer the survey when she makes, she'll, she's going to make a plug and then you're going to be receiving a link very soon. So my understanding is the objective of this is, you know, we're a department that has maybe two or three parts, depending on how you look at it. You know, the title says clinical epidemiology, medical informatics, and clinical epi, and then within medical informatics, there's the healthcare and clinical. Ep what are the new letters? <laughs> I'm, all, I'm trying to. BHCI and BCB. So if you think about it, maybe we have three parts. And then a lot of us do very different things. And when I go to faculty meetings, I don't even know what all the different faculty do. And so it became apparent that the students don't know what the faculty do. So the idea of these uh, faculty two-for-ones was not necessarily to present a specific project, although we might get to that, but just start by telling you a little bit about what we do and how we got here um, so that you know about us and you might be able to call on us if we can be a resource going forward. So that's essentially what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and how my projects that seem very strange actually, I think, do kind of fit together. <laughs> um, so my background is in health policy initially, and then after that, a PhD in health services research. And health services research is a lot like informatics. And what Karen read are two official definitions in the sense that you can probably come up with anything you want to study and fit it into this. So that's the good thing, right? So as I say, I'm a health services researcher and a gerontologist because I tend to focus on aging and chronic disease. But in health services research, you know, what works for whom at what cost and under what circumstances, how to improve the healthcare system. There are so many topics you can pick. That's the good side. The bad side is there's so many topics you can pick means there's so many methods and designs, right? There's no way you can be an expert in every theory, every method, every design you could ever use in health services research. And I think that's very similar in informatics. And so this is sort of a stream through what I'm doing with my work and what I'm starting to do with teaching is to how to think about how do we become 
in these multidisciplinary fields good enough <laughs> to do something useful. So that's what, um, what I've done before. I, I've been here eight years now, which is the longest job I've ever had uh, because I do a lot of project-based work and funded based, uh, externally funded. And this position lets me pull all those things together. But before this, um, I started out as a legislative aide in Columbus, Ohio. I worked in the state House of Representatives in Ohio. And then I went to grad school in France for a while to study French because it was fun. It had nothing to do with what I do now, although it's circling around. I'll tell you in a minute why it's important that I now have a master's in French. Um, and then I came back to New York and I worked for a private foundation. I actually worked for the Hartford Foundation, which does a lot in aging. And then I worked um, with them with Commonwealth and with several other foundations in New York City. And then from there, I went to the University of Minnesota, where I got a PhD in health services research. And I worked um, there in their aging center and in that department. And from there, I went to Boise State, where I set up a center for the study of aging and a master's certificate in aging. And then went back to New York to the Bronx. I went from Boise to the Bronx. There was actually a poster that said that once for the TWA had that I thought was great. But I could never get a good picture of it. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I would go back and forth from Boise to the Bronx, and I worked for a thing called the Center for Healthcare, um, for Home Care Research. So that was a provider-based research center within the Visiting Nurse Service. And then from there, I did a bunch of consulting for the VA for a couple of years, and then ended up here. <laughs> so it's been kind of a uh, tricky path. Um, but I think it's interesting to ask people what kinds of jobs they've had when you're in a field like this, informatics and health services that pulls from so many different ways and how we all get here is unique. So currently, and you'll notice these numbers add up to more than 100 because that's kind of the life of being faculty. So I probably spend, mo I spend most of my time doing research and most of that research is through the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center, which is here in clinical epidemiology. I'll tell you more about that. I've been doing more teaching. Uh, originally, I did no teaching at all. Um, so I'm doing the, this is why it's over 100%. We do teaching in the School of Medicine that we don't technically get any time to do, but we do it anyway. Um, in interprofessional education, clinical epi, and scholarly projects, I work with the medical students to help design their scholarly projects. IPE is something you guys don't do. It's interprofessional education around um, patient safety. And yesterday was one of the sessions. There are 52 sessions. I was session 52. I don't know why I'm last. Um, <laughs> you, you were 48, yeah. And it's really kind of fun because they bring the medical students, all the nursing students, the um, medical physics, the um, pharmacy, the laboratory medicine students together and mix them all up and then put them in small groups to go through patient safety, some patient safety training. And then um, um, there's a clinical epi track in the medical student training that uh, several of us are involved in. In the School of Public Health, I currently teach epi of aging and I also teach, I'm developing a research methods class for MPH students in the non-research focus which is public health practice. And then in DMICE, we're going to talk about this. It's a work in progress. What can I do in terms of teaching and supporting students in DMICE? So the EPC, quickly to tell you about what I do, and I'm keeping an eye on the time. So the EPC has been here at OHSU for a long time, since 97. The EPCs were founded in 97. We were one of the original ones. There are 13 centers across the United States who have this designation of Evidence-Based Practice Center. That's what EPC stands for. We're Pacific Northwest. We used to be Oregon, but we now have a collaboration with University of Washington and a small technical assessment group also in Tacoma. And so we changed our name a few years ago to become the Pacific Northwest EPC. Um, we're designated as that by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and we get a tiny little bit of money and a global contract. They're usually five-year contracts. And then we bid on specific projects. So we get that. So they issue calls for systematic reviews that they would like. We say we write a short proposal. There's a competition, but it's only among the 13, so it's sort of inside baseball which is really nice if you're, <laughs> it's always nice if you can get connected to people who have these global contracts because you're not competing against hundreds of people, you're competing amongst the 13 centers. There are other ones like that here at OHSU, David Doerr has been involved in some, 
through um, to develop quality measures. I know that um, John O'Connor has one with the state of Oregon where there's only five people who com compete for these different contracts. So it's just something to know about. Anyway, we've had, this hasn't been updated, but the EPC has been pretty successful in getting money. Um, and basically what the EPC does is systematic reviews, large usually, um, mostly to inform practice guidelines and sometimes to develop standards or methods. We have teams, um, so I've been lead on several. We have <laughs> librarians, some of whom are in the corner who work with us a lot. Uh, we have a lot of research staff, some who've come to, come to these meetings. You know, most of us are on the um, fifth floor on the other side. <laughs> you know, we even, we even have a physical divide. And then um, we pull people in from other parts of the university and from other universities to be on the teams that we do. And technically, when I talk to students, I tell them a systematic review has to have three things. The search has to be comprehensive. You have to assess the studies. You can't just tell us about them. You have to. There has to be some. How good are the studies? And then there has to be some sort of synthesis. It's not a book report. You don't say, Mr. S you know, Smith et al. said this. Jones et al. said this, whether it's a meta-analysis or qualitative. So that's the work we do. We take these topics and we try to find everything possible that fits the question, evaluate it, and synthesize it. And mostly we do the complete reports, but we also do a lot of other funky things. We do some rapid reviews. I've done a couple evidence maps. We do some technical briefs where there isn't a lot of evidence that has more sort of talking to stakeholders. And then sometimes we do scoping reviews. And you'll hear about a couple specific ones that Eilish and I are working on later. So the types of projects I've done in the, this isn't a complete list. <laughs> It's close, but it's not totally there. So some of the topics I've worked on have been informatics types topics, and um, Karen and Bill and I have been on these reviews, telehealth consultations, telehealth evidence map, health and information exchange. Then some of them have been more my subject area. Um, so I, I led a review on home-based primary care. I was part of a review on pressure ulcers. I was part of a review on case management, and I led a review on the impact of geriatricians. And then there's other projects that aren't really my topic area or even an informatics topic area, but it's more about the methods. So we've been doing a series of three um, TBI guidelines, traumatic brain injury guidelines, funded through the Department of Defense, passed through from Stanford University to us to do the reviews and to facilitate the guideline development. Um, I've done, we did a series of reviews, one of which I led that are all to redo the EMS guidelines, the um, surgeons group, which I'm forgetting their name, the American Congress of College of Surgeons, I think it is, is going to redo the emergency medical services guidelines. And so they've commissioned a bunch of reviews. And so I worked on a couple of those about the um, physiologic predictors. And then um, so every now and then I do a topic I really know nothing about, but focus on the methods like non-invasive testing for cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and then um, I'm not going to say anything about the last two because I least she's going to do it. The other work that I've done, added to this mix is I am doing some original research. So the EPC work is synthesizing other people's research, developing guidelines, methods, and this is I'm working with the Oregon Rural, pra Rural Practice-Based Research Network which is a um, PBRNs, Practice-Based Research Networks, have been around for a while. They were a, they're an effort to get research sort of out into the masses and away from academic medical centers to set up sites and networks so that you can do research outside of sort of the rarefied air of academic medical centers. Oregon has had one for quite some time, 17 years. If we were the only one that was exclusively rural through about 2012, and then 2012 they sort of changed their charter to include some urban practices. Most of these practices are not OHSU. That's kind of the idea. And it sets up a network so that you can do quality and research projects. But OPERN is part of a um, group of these that's called Metalark. The director's a bird watcher. So. All, all the names have, can't have come up to be birds. <laughs> um, you know, L.J. Fagan, he's a physician who's been on faculty here for a long time, just semi-retired. He's not allowed to totally retire. And he was just in Mexico trying to add, like, 200 birds to his list. So I'll hear about that tomorrow, I'm sure. 
But anyway, the network of networks it consists of seven of these PBRNs, five in the U.S. and two in Canada. And uh, about two years ago, I started working with them. And the reason it's so appealing to be connected to this type of research is this is a table they made up last year. But you're talking about across all seven of them, they represent 975 primary care practices with a potential of um, you know, 3.7 million patients. So this is being connected to these networks makes complicated research possible. And the project I have right now with them is to evaluate a program called the Serious Illness Care Program, which is to do advanced care planning with, for patients with serious illness. And we're comparing two different models. Um, it's a cluster randomized control trial. We're recruiting 42 practices from those seven networks, randomizing them to one of these two approaches to doing advanced <coughs> care planning and then following patients and clinicians over a year. Um, so that's what I'm, the other thing I'm working on. And this is funded through PCORI, so it has a huge engagement piece, which is kind of new for a lot of us. I mean, a lot of us have done some engagement, but not structured to the extent that you really need to do it with PCORI money. Um, so in addition to the research protocol, we have a whole engagement plan and about how we incorporate the PBRNs into this, how we incorporate external stakeholders, how do we have, we have patient and family advisors at three different levels in the project. So at the practice level, at the PBRN level, and then we have some at-large patient and family advisors. So there's a lot of work around the engagement and making sure that there's um, sort of communication across different groups. Anyway, so kind of what I wanted to say is across both these types of work, what I really focus on a lot is, you know, figuring out what the hammer is for the nail, right? As a methodologist, consider part of my job is figuring out, you know, the nails are all the questions, right? And what's the right hammer? And can we figure out what methods and what theories and what approaches are going to get us good information? and are going to move us forward. There's nothing, those of us in, on the policy side, and I've been a little bit on the policy side and a little bit on the research side, hate more than when you get to the end of the article and it says we need more research, right? But as a researcher, we always do that because it's true. <laughs> um, because one study is rarely going to solve the problem, which is why I do the work in the systematic reviews and guidelines, because it's about how do you take all the studies and pull them together and make them useful for policy or practice. On the other hand, you know, to move the fields forward, we have to work on methods and we have to come up with what's the best study we can do for that question at this time, given the resources we've got. And we don't want to squander our research resources. So that's where I think the methodology piece comes in. And so really what I wanted to ask all of you for a few minutes, so I'm going to stop talking in a minute, to think about and help me think about is, you know, for informatics research. You're in the Department of Informatics. I'm faculty in the Department of Informatics. You know, how do you identify questions? What kinds of designs and analysis? You know, what's happening in the field? What do you need to know to just be, you know, a player? And then what needs to, what do we need to push the envelope on? What are we not doing so well in terms of whether it's training people in informatics or whether it's, um, proposing research studies, you know, what are research studies answering the questions that people have in the field or not, and how do we do better at that? So what I really, what we've done or what we're working on, there have been a couple of, I've hunted around for people who've looked at, you know, sort of what's published in JANIA and what analytic methods are used. So, um, someone else looked at JAMA. And then someone else looked at public health journals, and they sort of give these descriptive things. Oh, you know, most stuff is still pretty low level, is the truth, in what's published in terms of statistical analysis. Most studies are still observational than trials, because trials are expensive. So that's not surprising. But how do we get to figure out what you as students and postdocs, is that what I'm supposed to say? Where's Diane? Am I supposed to say postdocs or fellows? Which is the one I'm not supposed to say? Okay. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what the terms were. This is me not knowing the training program real well. Anyway, we're trying to figure out across the classes, what's the research design and methods needs that students have to be successful? What do you already know? 
what don't you know? How do we figure out how to train you more efficiently? And how do we, you know, because there's no way we can teach you every method you would ever want. So what we're doing is, so now I want to ask people for some suggestions. You also, those of you who aren't in the these, who are those of you who are in HCI, not in ECB, um, <laughs> will get a link to a SurveyMonkey survey. Faculty have already done it. We, has, we asked all the faculty to, for their, each of their classes to say whether they cover these, think they cover these things, I, say, I should say, think they cover these things. <laughs> it's just like physicians think they say things to patients. We know faculty think they cover things. Um, so we have a list of things. We ask them what they think is covered in their class and then what they think they actually make you do. What's an exercise? So we want, we've asked some of you to do the same thing. What things have been covered in the classes you've taken so far? and what things have you actually done some sort of an active exercise in. And then just a couple quick open-ended questions, you know, what haven't you heard about that you think, you know, what do you think you need that you're not getting? Are there some topics that are covered like six in six classes and, you know, two would have been enough? Because we know, I think there's been some effort to eliminate some duplication on some things related to research. And then any other suggestions, because we're trying to figure out how to do this. So we'll start. So if you could both now for a couple of minutes before I hand it over to Eilish, get some feedback, and then if do the little survey, and then if you have other suggestions, I'm almost always here on the fifth floor. I'm here a lot. And then my email's pretty easy. But go ahead. So I'm just I'm a little confused by something, or at least yeah. I could use a clarification. Yeah. Um, so what are the goals? So the problem is, is that different pre-docs and post-docs might have different goals right. in mind for where they see themselves in the next five years of the career. And, so right. from your perspective as an educator, or yeah. as, as like thinking about the educational yeah. training, yeah. Um, are you thinking about guarding them more towards independent careers and that sort of thing? Or well, is it more about training their skill sets and making sure that they can you know, ask a good research question and design a study and answer that yeah. question? Well, I think there's both a floor and a ceiling. So this started out as a question about what do the PhD students need? Because there was a, this started out as a very pragmatic question because there was a quantitative methods class that was taught that never could cover everything everyone wanted and then there were never enough students and it hasn't been offered for a while. So we're trying to figure out, you know, there's a very practical question. What's the substitution for that quantitative methods class for PhD students? Okay. Then the broader question is, how do we cover what's sort of the minimum research methods anybody who gets a graduate degree in informatics should have? That's where you start to get the competencies and all the different things. And then the middle question is the people who actually want to do research, whether it's a master's thesis or whether they want to be involved in research in their job, what's going to help them be successful? So it's a three-part question, but I'm trying to get as much information well, and bucket it. Right. The, the problem there is that there are dramatically different, different skill right. sets that are needed for all three right. of those. But there's a floor, right? Each one sort of builds up, I would hope, because the PhD Not student... Not necessarily. Okay. Well, I would hope that the PhD student has to know that basic bit that we think all graduate informatics students should know, that the PhD student needs that plus more. And, and the person in the middle needs that basic bit plus half of the more. <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. I think there are different levels that different students need. But they're connected, at least, or they should maybe build on each other. Well, the issue here is that if you're thinking about independence, right? Yeah. A lot of the things that are predictive for independence are actually more soft skills as mm -hmm. opposed to hard skills. Because mm -hmm. there you have to know how to manage people. You have to know how to hire people. You have to know right. how to Well, be able so to... I am trying to focus on the research component. I still think you're true. A lot of my work in research is managing my team. Um, and I do agree that you need to know how to do those things, but we're also trying to figure out how do we deal with the technical content. So this really is not necessarily focused on being successful in informatics, but being successful in the research piece of informatics. And I would argue that anybody, and this is what I said to the medical students yesterday, you know, because some of them are like, oh, we don't care about epidemiology. <laughs> um, you know, which is fine, and some of, you know, some of the students that, in public health practice, they're like, oh, I don't care about research methods, and I get it. But, I mean, if you're in healthcare, 
you're going to be studied even if you don't do the studying. And you, there's a basic amount of literacy you need to have to understand how you're being studied, if nothing else. Then I think you have to understand the research to be able to interpret it for your patients. And then hopefully maybe you're actually going to get involved. But if you never want to do research as a person in healthcare, I think you at least have to be able to deal with those first two. You've got to be able to explain research to your patients or the public, and you have to be able to understand how people are studying you well enough to speak up if you think they're doing it wrong. You know, and I'm a researcher, not a clinician, so I want clinicians to speak up and tell me when we're designing a study, and they're like, well, that's the stupidest idea ever. <laughs> but they have to actually understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, um, so I'm happy to yield the floor to any other current PhDs yeah. here. I'm coming yeah. from a different but yeah. similar program at UC okay. San Diego. So mm -hmm. to answer the question of on the clinical side, mm -hmm. what methods training, the big gap for me was any just data analysis mm -hmm. training. That was a lot of stuff that I had to pick up on the job of collecting data, cleaning data, some basics about information visualization. And that was something that seemed pretty common across all the students, whether you're dealing with clinical data, any kind of data set. And then from there, if you needed machine learning or fancier methods, that was great. But that was the big gap for me is that's I just picked that up working with other people. So I don't know here. You never actually, like, touched the dirty data? Yeah. Right. Until it was my own that I had to work with. Yeah. So. yeah. No, that's true. Okay. Other? There. And then I'm going to turn it over to Eilish to actually talk about a couple actual projects we're working on. So I just am curious, um, uh, I know that there are research in academia and there's research in the private industries, um, and as a student, we don't really know what we don't know. That's true. Um, so <laughs> uh, for us to be putting suggestions as to what we want to know, um, well, it can help in a little bit <laughs> in, uh, in small no, ways. No, no, <laughs> I, I totally, we've said that in meetings. It is hard for students. On the other hand, some of you do know, like, what you think your thesis topic is, or some of you know what you think you might want to focus on. So I think there's various degrees of people who know what they don't know. And, uh -huh. um, and you do know at least things you've heard too many times and things you've never heard. So at least if you could... Yeah, tell us I that mean, in the that's, survey. That's so one, I totally get that the one, survey is an imperfect thing. It's just a way to incorporate your feedback along with the feedback from the faculty, al along with and alumni. We did send, we are asking some alums to, and then with these sort of research articles that look at you know what are the trends in the field combined with the competencies that are required. So hopefully all those pieces of data I can somehow pull together and come up with something of a plan, which will be flawed, and can, then hopefully can I we'll add to, better. Sure. Can I add to this a little bit? Uh, so um, one of the things that I was really interested in when I joined the program is um, when I saw that not we have not attached ourselves to uh, some of the private industries, because most of the research, uh, if you're a research hub, how do you improve the curriculum, right? You attach yourself to industries, bring people on to see what is needed in our curriculum and how we can send our people from here to those to get, um, you know, uh, to develop the skills that we need for, the, uh, for researching in the private industries as well. So I was wondering if our curriculum is looking at um, partnering <laughs> with, with private industries here yeah. locally. I mean, is it that's, I mean, there's other people who could answer that better because they do do outreach to, I know that's why we have that one presentation every year from Kaiser. I don't, have we had that this year yet, where Kaiser comes in and they do the what they look for in informatics people? I know we've had some discussions and connections with Intel, um, and you've led a lot of those, I think, some of them. So the department, I don't know as much about that piece, I'll be honest, okay. but I know that there are some activities, and, and if there, you've got better suggestions, take them to Bill. Other Comments. So I'm going to hand it over to Eilish, um, and she's going to do the second part of this. And this started because we actually do a couple of projects together. And um, this is one of the examples. There aren't a huge number of examples of people from the two sides of the department. So, because she's on the other side. And um, Eilish is, she can tell you more about her background and who she is. And you can just do it. Okay. Let me 
me just get this on here. I'm sorry, I was in, usually in clinic at this time, so I don't make it here as often as I'd like. Um, my name is Eilish Boudreau, and I am faculty here, um, but I'm also, uh, I came uh, here by way of a very sort of roundabout route. Um, I started out as a bench chemist. I have a PhD in biophysics, was doing very, very basic science research on DNA, making DNA, looking at the structure, um, using high resolution NMR spectroscopy, then got into imaging. When I finished my PhD, I then went to medical school, um, continued doing research, and then I did a neurology residency, and then I did fellowships in epilepsy and sleep medicine. And then when I came back to OHSU, I came, went through the informatics program. Um, and now I'm on staff at OHSU and the VA. And um, so I've really done everything from bench, very, very basic chemistry, to animal research, to human research, and have now making forays into you know, areas that I didn't really expect myself to be in, which is health services research, um, in large part out of necessity. And I'll talk about some of the projects. And as Annette said, we, um, our, our collaborations develop very organically. But I think that, um, you know, as I look back now, and I'm going to talk about three projects, they've really helped me. Um, I think Probably some of these projects drive Annette crazy, but um, she's been very uh, nice about continuing to participate. So I'm just going to give you a really broad overview of some of these um, so you can get a flavor of, I think the important thing here is part of this is so people get uh, find out what various people in um, informatics are doing, but also how I think and why I think our collaboration is really helpful, at least from my perspective. OK, I'm going to talk about three projects. Some of you who've had me in class may have heard of some of these, and I've got some co-investigators in here for various things. Um, so the first one's optimizing VA sleep care. The second one's sleep medicine cohorts. And then the other one is an area that I've been working in for probably two and a half decades since I was a graduate student. Um, and that is in aerospace um, physiology. And you know what? That shouldn't be epidemiology. It must be a neurocognitive evaluation of fitness to fly. Well, there should have been a colon. But anyway, um, so let's start with the problem, the first project. So here's a graph of access to VA sleep care services. And I'm not going to go into, um, there's a lot of, of details about how we deliver care, what kind of care we <coughs> deliver. But the gist here is, you can see in 2012, we're down here. And this happens to be new patients referred into the VA nationally. And in fiscal year 2007, you know, we've gone from just over 100,000 to 350,000. Um, and that's every year, new patients. Um, there's lots of things that go into sleep care. They involve, you know, one of our most common diagnoses, sleep apnea. That one involves sleep testing. And then if it's positive, giving people equipment and following them. There's insomnia. Often patients who have sleep apnea have other sleep problems that are very common in the population. So it's not a single time like we see them and then they go off and they're cured and everything's done. This is chronic disease management. Um, so I could pretty much insert anything we do in sleep and the curve's going to look like this. I could insert the number of sleep studies. I could insert the number of, you know, uh, encounters in the system for sleep care. And if you look in... 2000 up to now, the curves are going to look like this. They're really crushing. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's just the percent increase. Yeah, sorry. That's so basically the the point here is. Thanks for asking, Nicole. Um, is 
Sleep is a relatively new field compared to cardiology, pulmonology, neurology. Um, and it, it, many, there's still VAs that don't offer any sleep care. Um, so what we've seen is as the field has matured, and as people are more aware of sleep disorders, we get more and more referrals. There's also evidence for a number of reasons that the prevalence is increasing in the population. But anyway, so what we have here is we started out with very small operations, not at every medical center, generally understaffed, and then we've dumped a huge number of patients into the system. You'll also notice we've got the conflicts starting in 2003 that have infused a huge number of younger patients. So what the, the problem we have is a huge number of patients needing care and very limited resources. There aren't enough sleep physicians in the system to, or in the country, to, who are trained in sleep um, to take care of them. And the other problem is even if we had that, using traditional care models, we would completely break the bank. Like, we can't care for this volume of patients um, using the methods we've used thus far. So just to get a general sense, there are 20 million veterans in the U.S., 9.1 million are enrolled in to get some kind of care through the VA. 58% um, of those patients are located rurally. Um, and we have about 1.2 million that have been diagnosed thus far with sleep apnea. And based on pretty good data, we suspect that up to 35% of veterans are at risk for sleep apnea. So maybe we've diagnosed 60% who are out there. That's assuming that the prevalence remains steady, which it doesn't look like it is. So the bottom line is this is what the curves look like and it's probably not gonna change anytime soon. So that's the problem. It's this huge um, sort of scope. The other thing I thought was very interesting, I've gotten slides from a, a colleague that I work closely with, um, Dr. Sarmiento in San Francisco. But this is a VA map showing where VA sleep labs are. This is in lab. So you notice the number I gave you, 58% of the 9.1 million veterans are rurally located. But look at where the sleep labs are. We've got this huge chunk um, of territory, basically, you know, between the Midwest and the West Coast that doesn't have a lot going on. Um, and that's another huge problem. How do we get care to people? Um, so what are the challenges? There's a lot of challenges um, that we're working on, but they fall into two bins. So the first is, how do we measure what we're doing? And let me give you a very concrete example of something that every program in the country was struggling with, you know, up until fairly recently. So I'm in our lab a number of years ago, and a good administrator with clinical history comes up and says, I'm really concerned about this problem. You guys did 750 sleep studies last year. We just ran the numbers and it looks like you're overstaffed. Now, again, if you remember the curve I just showed you, so they're, they're telling us, you know, right around in here that we're, over, we're, under, we're overstaffed. I'm like, okay, uh, there's a disconnect here, but I keep listening. And, and, you know, then when she tells you you did 750 sleep studies last year, I'm like, well, that's the first problem. We did 2,000. Here's our logbook. At this point, we're still using logbooks. And we did 2,000 sleep studies. And she said, we can't use logbook data. We have to go by the data in the system. And I'm like, but the data in the system, you know, is capturing 40% of our workload. Um, and so this happened over and over again. I have colleagues in other places who would come into work and find out that staff had been pulled because they were over-resourced. And we're all like, what planet, you know, are, are these administrators living on? And where is this data coming from? It's what I call um, imaginary numbers. So they kept coming to us with numbers that absolutely made no sense. And so a lot of us started asking questions about where are these numbers coming from? How are they coming? How are you getting them? Um, and that's when I became involved in, in another area I never thought I would see myself, which is coding and systems and how do we capture a workload. 
So we've done a lot of work in that area and actually shifted the, the conversation. So in our region, our vision in 2012, we rolled out revised coding for sleep. So part of the problem had been that sleep services were offered in a number of different departments, pulmonary, neurology, mental health, and they would always get coded for, for whatever department. So when people would pull national numbers, they would just get highly variable picture. They weren't capturing a lot of the data. But just for our region alone, the Northwest region, in the space of one month in 2012, our workload went up by 29%. Now, obviously, it didn't go up by 29%. That's how much we were missing. When we rolled this out nationally, it went up by over 100%. One colleague um, at another institution um, found out that they weren't capturing any of his workload, and his workload in one month went up 700%. And as he likes to joke, I'm not sure what I was doing for 80 hours a week prior to that, but uh, apparently nothing, according to the administration. So that's really, really helped us, um, is understanding how they generate the data. We still have problems, and it's a lot more complicated than I ever envisioned. Um, but that's changed our conversation a lot, just being able to capture our workload. So, that's, that's been a huge um, issue. The other is, how do we develop better care models? So the problem, as I mentioned, um, is the traditional model of care is you go see a sleep physician, then maybe we send you for an in-lab sleep study, which involves having to come in a two-to-one ratio with a tech. We study you one or two nights in the lab. It's incredibly expensive. And then we give you a CPAP machine, which is at least $350 and then we follow you presumably for life. Um, and that's just sleep apnea. So there are a lot of emerging models, um, things like can you do electronic consults, which we have in the VA? Can you um, send people home or mail them home sleep apnea testing equipment, which is getting a lot more sophisticated and better? And then can you use telehealth? video uh, into other VA centers that don't have facilities or video into the patient's home we now have. So we're experimenting with all of these models because it's absolutely clear, you know, we're already drowning under the volume we have and it's only going to get worse. Because remember, every year we're adding a huge number of patients to our system. We're not even getting to the diagnosis, let alone managing long-term all of these patients. So it's very, very clear that we have to use these models. Most of us in, within the VA have been using them for a while. The problem is we don't have any data that it's equivalent. We think it's equivalent, but it really is a problem. We, the burden's really on us to show because we're operating, in many cases, outside of practice guidelines for, for, um, you know, for sleep medicine. So there's really a burden that we collect data at the point of care and that we try to make some quality assessment um, on whether these models are equivalent. And even modest, you know, mild changes can cause huge savings for the VA. So last year the VA spent $250 million on CPAP equipment. Um, so if you just make small adjustments, you really um, can save a lot in care. Um, so this VA system issues on a high level, pretty much you could take pretty much every topic in Bill Hirsch's introduction to clinical informatics and there's an issue related to it um, and then some. We've got data capture issues at the point of care. We do have specialized templates that we've deployed at least in the Northwest and then starting to to push them out to other sites where we can actually have people enter data as they're providing care, but specific preset items can be put into the centralized clinical data warehouse at the VA for easy, you know, easy retrieval. And they're not only about what we're doing, they're about care pathways, which is what we really need information. Data siloing. So the VA, even though it's the the largest sort of managed healthcare system in the country, it does have a centralized database, the clinical data warehouse. Um, and so you would think that the data we would get out of it would be more consistent. And in fact, that is not true. A lot of the data siloing occurs 
because people are using different interfaces to pull the data, and what we're finding is that the interfaces are making all sorts of assumptions that often aren't correct, and people are coming up with different numbers. We also have different pots of care, so everything, all care that gets done within the VA actually um, goes into this clinical data warehouse but care that is outsourced does not. Choice care, all these different programs. Prosthetics care is in a different database. So we have the data siloing. I already talked huge coding issues, workload tracking. Right now they can't track physician workload for sleep care. And they said it's probably not gonna happen anytime soon because the system's just not set up to do it. Um, and then care delivery models, which I talked about. We have telehealth. We actually have a virtual care path program that we're piloting with rural patients. So a lot is going on, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so the project that Annette uh, and I are working on together is this Office of Rural Health Telemedicine Project. And it's basically you know, a large uh, national grant over three years to improve care delivery. And what we've built out here in Portland is a lot of the data analytics. So there's lots of good data analysts in the VA, but if they, we need sleep specific data expertise. Because a lot of times people are pulling numbers and as I said, making all sorts of incorrect assumptions and um, it's very, very messy. So we really became convinced that we needed sleep specific expertise so we could make sure people who are making decisions, both on the local, regional, and national level, are using real numbers, um, which has not happened in the past. Um, and then there's lots of data that needs to be, management, to be managed, and as I mentioned, the sleep expertise. So um, again, it's a very large project, um, and we've built a little <coughs> local data analytics team, um, of which Annette is a critical part of. So these are just some of the, <laughs> yes, but everybody, everybody contributes. But Connor's our data analyst, um, and he's done a great job. And he, in the 10 months he's been working with us, he's learned all the different ways you can pull data and have it not be meaningful. Um, meaning he's not doing that, but he's trying to track down why did people come up with numbers. Because we have knowledge about the different programs, and so we can look at data and go, like, that, that's not even ballpark. And so then we have to dig and figure out, you know, why do two centers that do the same volume of care, and one last month said they delivered no care, and one, you know, had, uh, you know, 500 consults. So, um, and it's very interdisciplinary. So we work closely with teams at the VA in San Francisco, but um, also with, with there are eight different centers um, involved in this, in this team. So there's a lot of, of uh, interdisciplinary work. So that is that project uh, attempted in a nutshell. And the other two projects I'm just gonna talk about very briefly. So the other one is a sleep and circadian health um, project. And this really is, this came out of, there was a RFA um, by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood <coughs> Institute for new cohorts. Um, and so they are looking for, you know, what do we need in new co cohorts in heart, lung, blood disease, and sleep gets placed um, under that institute. Um, as I mentioned, sleep is a new field, so we don't have as good long-term epidemiologic data. And we're a smaller field. Um, so one of the issues we've struggled with is how do we compete or work with these large uh, other fields like cardiology to justify you know, why we need a sleep-specific cohort. A lot of the cohorts to date have been built into other studies, cardiology studies, um, you know, as subcomponents. So we were really thinking about this as a field, and part of this was done as uh, part of the Sleep Research Network, which I've been very involved in, and that's a consortium of researchers at CTSAs around the country um, and others. So what we were able to do is um, we were able to get some end-of-year money from the VA. At the end of the fiscal year, sometimes the VA has 
pots of money that it can push out, and it usually it gets, you know, they say we've got this pot of money for 100000 or 200000 and if you can give us a proposal and take the money and do something with it before the end of the fiscal year, like in the next two weeks, you can have it. So we were lucky enough, um, and a lot of colleagues in informatics helped us sort of get that money over here and attach it to the contract that we have for the previous project. Looking at um, what, what do we know about sleep cohorts to date? And so the purpose of this was we, the, the sleep community has decided we are going to put in an application um, in a year and a half. Um, for uh, it's the last date we can submit for it. But there was a lot of discussion about, well, how do we figure out what we really need? How do we figure out what would be the highest impact cohort? So one of the things, based on my work with Annette, I had suggested was, could we do some kind of systematic review, gap analysis, that looked at what cohort studies have been conducted in the past or in progress in a very sort of rigorous fashion, um, and what high priority topics haven't been covered and we think need to be covered. And it really focuses on how do we pull together a team um, and look at what's been done, try to figure out what's that impact on other fields. Because anything we do in sleep, because we are a small field, a new field, we really have to frame it in terms of what we also contribute to other fields. How do we improve cardiovascular health, pulmonary health, by improving aspects of sleep? Um, so these were some of the questions. And the idea was to get everybody together provide some structure to how we think about what we've done, what needs to be done. Um, and so we were able to get this 10-month contract. Um, and here, as I mentioned, were the gaps. Identify gaps, figure out what tools we already have that we could use for a cohort study, and organize and mobilize key stakeholders. And I think this is something that's hugely of value is um, the whole process that Annette talked about where you bring stakeholders together, you ask questions, you frame those questions, um, is hugely valuable and it provides um, a way for um, you to come out at the end with some really concrete answers to some of your questions. Um, and one of the things that Annette's been especially helpful for me in is how to frame questions. I come to her all the time and say, this is what I, this is what I want. And she'll think about it and she'll say, well, is that really what you want or do you want this? And it's always the way she reframes it. Um, so a lot of times we think we know what we want, but we haven't asked it in a fashion that is really a productive way to, to answer it. So that's where she's been especially helpful. Again, team effort, lots of people in, in this room, Annette, Chandler, Francis, we have colleagues at UCSF, the Sleep Research Network. Um, Katie Sarmiento is also on this one. And we've got people on the panel from academic centers around the country, um, industry, and, and patient reps. So really, it's, it's uh, infrastructure uh, to get people going. And then the last one I'm going to just say for a few minutes, um, it's neurocognitive uh, evaluation of fitness to fly. So what's the problem? So the problem is there's a lot of aircraft activity in the world right now. We have 5,000 aircraft in, in the air at any given time, 10 million scheduled pas passenger flights a year in the country. This is from the FAA. Two million passengers fly every day in and out of U.S. airports. Two million and then a lot of different U.S. airports. So, um, you know, aviation is the safest mode of transportation. Last year there were about 37,000 motor, fatal motor vehicle accidents and only 350 fatal aviation accidents. And most of those are not commercial. That's sort of recreational pilots, small general aviation. Um, so it's an incredibly safe mode of flight, but there's a reason for it. It's incredibly regulated. It wasn't always safe. 
part of the, the current regulatory structure we have came out of having a lot of plane crashes in the 50s um, where you were losing a lot of aircraft with a lot of human life. Um, so there's been a lot of effort on that. So the problem is, and I'm going to mainly address, this applies to all branches of sort of aviation, general aviation, the recreational pilot, but I'm going to just focus on the commercial airline pilot. So what happens if you have a pilot who's been flying 20 years, has a lot of experience, Maybe he has a, a mini stroke, a TIA, or maybe he gets blinding migraine headaches, or maybe he's had a mild traumatic brain injury. What happens after they recover from that? How do you get them back to flying? What do you need to know about their neurocognitive, their neuropsychological function? Because if you're in a cockpit, it's an incredibly complex um, set even though you're incredibly well-trained, there's a lot you have to keep straight. There, in, in larger aircraft, there's at least two pilots, but not in every aircraft. And so what happens if, you know, what do you need to know about that pilot to ensure that they can go back and function at the level that they have to to keep aviation as safe as it is? And we really worry with neurologic issues how do we predict or how can we figure out what the risk is if someone's going to have an acute event in the cockpit that could be fatal not only for them but for the people they're flying. So it's really a balance between safety and, and loss. You don't want to be grounding a bunch of pilots who have a huge amount of expertise. They all end up going on disability. You may ground them, say you ground them in their 50s and they still have another decade potentially of flying. So it's, it's a incredibly contentious um, topic, um, one that has threatened to boil over the policy into Congress out of the hands of people who sort of do the evaluations. So um, as part of my work with the Aerospace Medical Association, um, looking at how we can do more systematic reviews in aerospace medicine, one of my, um, actually one of my mentors who's worked a lot in this brought this topic and said, can we get some kind of systematic review going so we at least know where we are, where we're starting from, because no one's really happy with the process. Um, and so really in this case, the advantages of our collaboration, I'm not going to go into the details of what that project entails and why it's so contentious, but, but the issue is there's really, um, People are at loggerheads about it. Um, you know, if you talk to the pilot groups, they're, they're concerned with the length of time it takes. They're concerned with people unnecessarily getting grounded. And people who fly, fly not because it's just sort of a job you show up to. They're passionate about it. And so this just makes them nuts. We're, we're messing with their livelihood. Um, and I, I get why they get so passionate about it. But on the other hand, you have to worry about people like, do you want to be the person who certifies someone to fly who then, you know, like crashes a plane with 350 people on it? So it's trying to get this balance. And one of the things that doing the systematic review has been so helpful for is getting everybody to the table. So to my knowledge, this is the first time a group of pilots, researchers, individuals who do regulation from the FAA um, are all at the same table. I mean, people do talk across, but in a formal way. This has really provided us with a vehicle to get everybody together and say, look, we're going to, we just want to look at our data. Let's just ask the question, what do we know about the tests that we use for neurocognitive evaluation for fitness to fly? What don't we know? So we can figure out what we need to do to make at least the science behind it better. So we're really focusing on the science, but it really has provided a structure for us to start building some collaborative work um, and to identify key gaps and frame questions. It's really important in this day and age of limited funding to be able to show potential funders that you've really been thoughtful about how you've identified your gaps. And one of the problems, I'll put it in quotes, of, of aviation medicine, aerospace medicine, is we're almost a victim of the fact that flying is so safe. They're like, what's the issue? Flying's already super safe. Like, 
where's the, where's the problem? We've got more pressing issues that we need to spend research on. So we really have an obligation to highlight what we've done and what we need to do. So again, a huge team effort. Annette, um, Cynthia, and Tamara are the RAs on it, and this stakeholder panel that involves a number of people from, you know, researchers, academics, pilot reps, regulatory, um, but as as our stakeholder panel. So in closing, um, really my take-home message as a researcher. Um, you know, engage your colleagues in evidence-based medicine early in your research because what I found is they've really helped me get clarity on what we need to do um, rather than I think we think a lot of evidence-based medicine is occurring after research has been done. You know, then you bring people in to help you synthesize everything. And I think that's actually backwards. Um, they certainly serve a huge function there. But I think we need to engage them very early on um, and that has been incredibly helpful as we've thought about the VA sleep project and we're starting to write grants to try to show that what we're doing is at least equivalent to the traditional care model. It's been incredibly helpful to have her help us frame these questions in an answerable way and keep us focused on what are the most important issues so that we come out at the other end, which is something that we can use clinically. Um, so engage them early on and often, um, and that's all I have. And if there are any questions for Annette or me. Dana? I'm really intrigued by the stakeholder groups that you were able to get together. And I'm just wondering if you could give us a little more information about the consensus process. Like how do you, when, when everybody's in such different places, how do you then decide what actually moves forward in your research? Right. So I don't know if this is a quite, I'll answer it a little bit, but then I'm going to hand it to Annette. And so I'll give you the example of the aviation one. Um, so I, I worked in that field. I know a lot of people in it. I work. Um, you know, very involved in the Aerospace Medical Association. So I knew the players that had to be there and I knew who to talk to. So a lot of what I did was who are the most reasonable people that we can get to the table who are key? I mean, it's not that we don't want, we, we really wanted a true sample of differing views, but you also have to like, who am I going to get there who can commit to working through some difficult things and being on calls with people that they're not used, that they're used to being at loggerheads with versus actually <coughs> collaborating with them, at least on an official, you know, sort of way. So um, part of that's sort of understanding the field and figuring out who can we, can we use for this. But a lot of, for me, has been, I could have gotten the group together. I wouldn't have known what to do with them, though, how to move it forward. And that's where I think the evidence-based practice structure has been so incredibly helpful because we can bring in this neutral third party, you know, who's a methodologist and say, here's the published process and we're just going to follow that. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Annette to make some, some comments about it. And we're it. at the time and I'll just say yeah. it, it varies by project. So this project had a very political component. Um, to getting the people together, so not just to get their input to make sure the question was right, but to also get their buy-in at the beginning so that the product will be useful, which is different than some other projects where it's much more the stakeholders provide sort of technical support versus like the PCORI funded work where the stakeholders really shape how we're rolling out the implementation of the advanced care planning. So it really varies depending on the project a lot. <laughs> and it's a lot of work, um, which is sort of the, this idea that researchers like sit in the office all by themselves or the lab all by themselves doesn't really fly anymore. And it's really hard to get any research funded that way. So sort of figuring out how to do that stakeholder engagement is one of those skills that might be on the list. <laughs> Any other? Okay, great. Thank you.